All right, so we got another mushroom cloud, this time imposing itself on the skyline of one Tashkent, Uzbekistan. If you don't know where that is, all you really need to know is that it's somewhere in Eurasia. It was very close to Russia, and they do a lot of trade with Russia. In fact, that's their primary trading partner. There's 35 million people there, and there are suspicions that they might possibly maybe be manufacturing weapons for the Russians, but who really knows? This is all speculation. You can bet that the authorities are likely going to come out and say, meh, it's no big deal. Because understand that in war, you don't want to demonstrate weakness if you can avoid it. So you always want to play down when an enemy is able to get one past your defenses. So they're already coming up with weird cacamamey theories like uh, it was lightning that struck an electric vehicle or something crazy like that or lightning struck a natural gas pipeline or who knows, but you know, it is what it is. We're never truly going to know. We're going to talk about how this factors into the whole geopolitical calculus in just a moment. We also need to talk about metro stations across Russia being retrofitted to act as nuclear bomb shelters. You heard correct. When everybody in Europe is scrambling to purchase the nuclear-capable F-35 bombers, I mean, they got orders coming out the yin-yang. You got Russia getting Muscovites prepared to endure nuclear Armageddon. Well, Dmitry Medvedev has basically said, okay, this is it. We're going to war with NATO. <sighs> My friends, time is of the essence. Prepare while you can. The stock market appears to be in free fall once again. Stagflation is rearing its ugly head. The price of oil is skyrocketing. Couldn't have foreseen that at all. Well, we've been saying that for some time now. Everything is getting more expensive. People are getting into more and more amounts of debt. We may well be seeing a government shutdown in the not-so-distant future. They're saying that people's savings uh, from the pandemic will be completely dried up by October, more or less. And that's when things really start to get interesting in an austerity sort of way. We're already seeing it rear its ugly head in places like Philadelphia, where people are so desperate and struggling that they are pillaging and raiding Target stores. They're pillaging iPhone stores to get the bare necessities. And that's how you know that you still have a window of opportunity. They're not raiding the grocery stores yet. They've hit up the alcohol uh, last night. They were raiding the liquor stores. So really the order of operations is technology to distract themselves from the people that they've become. Uh, Liquor to just wash away their sorrows when that fails to, to appease them. And then ultimately it's food because everybody's got to eat. So we still got time. There's still a brief window for you to get the best out of this Goldilocks zone of time to prepare and to maximize. Don't wait until the emergency alert system sends you that message on October 4th to be like, oh, maybe I should become a prepper because you know what? On October 5th, the price of everything in the prepping world is likely going to skyrocket because everybody's going to get the bright idea. Oh, maybe this is real. Maybe we should take this seriously. Uh, probably not. It'll fade away by October 6th. It always does. Look at how history is repeating. We have the cheering on of a Nazi war criminal, unironically, in the Canadian Parliament. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. You know what that is, I think? I think that's like a collective Freudian slip of sorts. It's like they said the quiet part out loud, you know? It, it, it's the culmination of all the corruption and the hypocrisy and uh, the, the contradictions within this system, the things that we're not supposed to talk about just coming to the surface all at once in this glorious clown world display. I mean, it really was beautiful the way that it wasn't beautiful what happened at all, and somebody's going to take that out of context, but it was beautiful the way the whole scheme came undone there, wasn't it? It really was. It, it was poetic, in a way. <sighs> this is the world we're entering, man. But still, have lots of kids. Have lots of babies because, you know, most people aren't nowadays and uh, the way things are going. Oh, man. Okay, uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. So this guy, the Russian admiral that uh, the Ukrainians said they killed. You can't see him in there. The big head's in the way. This guy right here, they released this video today. Apparently this video is from six days ago. Now what we have here is a classic 
situation that we've seen throughout this conflict where one side says some high-ranking commander was killed, the other side uh, does not confirm or deny it, kind of letting it run on, and it turns out that while the guy's alive, but maybe they were in the hospital for some time, that's the vibes I'm getting from this guy. Regardless, Russia is holding the, the UK and the United States responsible for the attack on the Sevastopol headquarters. Apparently there was a meeting there at the time. It would make sense that you would, you would only waste one of your weapons if there was going to be some strategic utility, aside just the pure victory to take attention away from the fact that maybe things weren't going so well on the front lines. But um, this is suspicious. It's suspicious for numerous reasons, okay? And we're going to talk about the other stuff, but I want to talk about these things before I forget about them. So this was the image the other day, Sergei Shoigu. This guy was supposed to have been killed. The Ukrainian intelligence services said that they had killed this guy, high-ranking commander of the Black Sea Fleet, the top guy in the Black Sea Fleet. The Black Sea is critical right now. This is where World War III absolutely will likely start in the Black Sea. Well, at least this week, it's the most probable. So this fella here, they show him on the screen, looks as though he's in some kind of hospital bed or something. Mind you, and that's what a lot of people are saying here, his eyes weren't open, he was completely still, and we have ourselves a, a classic Budinov situation where everybody thinks that Budinov is dead and it's a deep fake, and for all we know, I mean, I, apparently Budinov was in the United States the other day, was in a mask, N let's not go there, of course. He's still alive, was he probably injured, was there probably something going on at the time? Probably. Anyways, so, next to him is another guy in a similar chair. So it's hard to say what's going on here because he's in a similar chair. So if this guy was in a hospital bed, you would think that, you know, this guy wouldn't have a similar chair behind him because this guy would clearly be alive. But you just never know. You really just never know with these things, man, anymore. And the Russians are being incredibly tight-lipped about the outcome of this. They said one person had died. And uh, you just can't believe anything on either side. And I understand that we here in the West, we here who are, I don't want to say the word awake, because everybody, you know, one side's awake and one side's woke. But people here who are critical thinkers, we understand that our media is largely full of shit and in the back pockets of corporations and uh, corrupt government officials. But that doesn't mean we just automatically believe everything the other side says and just uh, pretend like they're saints in every way. That's a very dangerous slippery slope into itself. There are evil forces vying for power all around the world, okay? And really, we, we have to choose from the lesser of two evils. Yes, I know. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that this guy's 100 yet, yet. I'm sure it'll probably come out that maybe he was injured or maybe he wasn't even there. And this is just uh, the Russians letting the lie go on a little bit so it can be even more embarrassing. But I will say that it's... If for even for either side, it, it looks very bad when they come out and they make a claim like that, whether it was with uh, Budinov or the other guy, the uh, commander of the Ukrainian armed forces. I totally forgot his name already. It's been so long since we've talked about him. They said that he died. I even made a video on it because the evidence looked pretty compelling at the time. And uh, it could very well be that he had some sort of medical condition that was preventing him from making all these appearances. And when he was on camera, he looked kind of strange. There could be some half-truth to this. Most often, the truth is somewhere in the middle, all right? So either way, Moscow is blaming uh, you-know-who for that, right? They're blaming the, um, the usual suspects for that. Moscow claims there's no doubt that the U.S. and the U.K. planned the Black Sea Fleet headquarter missile attack. And would you know it because they're constantly flying reconnaissance planes around the Black Sea. At this point, both sides know that the other... I mean, I would arguably say since the beginning of this conflict, NATO and the Russian authorities have known they've been at war with one another. But for the sake of not running too quickly up that escalatory ladder they don't always admit when they've either been hit and they'll downplay and they'll minimize attacks on themselves because of course it makes them look weak to their population unless it is strategic to do so unless it's conducive 
towards whatever ends they have in mind. Uh, in this case, it would be to galvanize the population for more war. According to this article, Putin is preparing for eternal war. Spending on the army and the Russian budget will increase to a record since the times of the USSR. Not at all surprised. Most people don't even remember, don't even realize that just a day ago, Moscow was hit by a massive uh, airstrike, uh, drone strike on one of their military bases near Moscow. Didn't even make the news. And that's just a sign of the times. We're living in a day and age where Moscow can be attacked and actually have uh, massive explosions. And, uh, you know, it can be seen for miles away and it won't even make the news. According to uh, this Ukrainian guy here, or is this a Russian guy? Somebody saying some rumor about something that something is going to happen on September 29th. It was 2013. What? That must be a typo. That's got to be a typo. Or I guess, you know, something will have happened 10 years ago. We'll see. Um, anyways, you know, it, it's very easy to make a prediction like something is going to happen this week or tomorrow or within 72 hours at this period of time because everything happens within. Like I could just say, yes, in the next 48 hours, there's going to be a major incident around the world. It's going to be a massive explosion somewhere. Oh, look, Uzbekistan, right? So you, you just, you know, it's, it's too easy right now. It's too easy to be a bear at this point. Metro stations across Russia are being prepared for bomb shelters. Subways in Russian cities are being converted into shelters and anti-radiation shelters to prevent or to protect Russians from various nuclear weapons. New requirements for the use, and this is from Moscow Times, which is a, a how would you say, a Russian, uh, a, a English-run Russian website that kind of spins Western propaganda into Russia. New requirements for the use of the metro are already being developed by scientists from the All-Russian Research Institute for Civil Defense and Emergency Situations. I should say, however, in spite of the fact that they tout the Russian or the Western narrative, they're, for the most part, relatively on point. They're kind of like a Newsweek, you know? They have to, they have to be, they can't just make wild claims without any evidence. So I would put a lot of stock in what they're saying. In fact, we reported on this six months ago that Moscow was getting ready to retrofit, but this is in addition to that, okay? Adaptations of subways for civil defense protective structures. Ask yourself, are they doing anything in your neck of the woods to protect you from the inevitable nuclear war that awaits? What happens when an error on the scale that we've seen in the Canadian Parliament recently? Let's extrapolate that to this broader war at large. What happens when these people make a blunder of that magnitude in the context of this nuclear sensitive theater. So, you know, if you had Zelensky, you had uh, people from Germany's government, you had the conservatives who are now acting as if they weren't there applauding as well, okay? They're using it as a political football. Look, nobody wants Trudeau out as much as me at this point in time. I never was a political channel. Go back a year ago even, most people will say Nate's a middle-of-the-road, apolitical kind of guy. This day and age, because of a lot of the gun stuff and what he's trying to do there, many people know my opinions on Mr. Trudeau. But, I mean, everybody was guilty in that chamber. And it's just a collective Freudian slip. It's, it's actually foreshadowing for what's coming. A lot of people think, oh, this is going to shed some light on you know, the Nazi ties to the Azov Battalion and Ukraine and the far right there and all this stuff. Well, that stuff was known about long ago. I worry, in fact, that this is going to normalize it because you got tensions just rising all over the world. In fact, I called it long ago. I called it long ago when I said that what's going to happen is all this climate chaos and this war and stuff like that, it's going to cause a massive refugee crisis. It's going to promote... Um, it's going to promote uh, populism in, in countries that are receiving these immigrants. It's going to create all kinds of civil unrest and disputes amongst those populations. You're going to see the emergence of uh, xenophobic sentiment against any uh, minorities within those countries. And, uh, you know, it's going to potentially fuel some extremism of sorts which is ultimately going to uh, factor into where this whole war is going. I don't exactly know yet. 
Now, people's grievances on all sides are justified. I mean, whether it's a country who's receiving a lot of illegal immigrants, your grievances are 100% justified. But we need to be careful because typically it's times like these that precede times of, of atrocity and tragedy. And I do worry that this uh, blunder in the Canadian Parliament is, it was an accident, but I don't think we're going to learn from the mistake, unfortunately. In fact, I think things are going to get worse from here on in. I mean, we have Mitch McConnell. Actually, let me finish the piece on the uh, metro stations being outfitted with bomb shelters. According to the Russian government, uh, they're going to uh, adapt the subways for anti-radiation shelters and refugees, as well as protecting people from the effects of conventional high explosive and fragmentation weapons. After the war in Ukraine began, the Kremlin ordered bomb shelters across Russia to be inspected and repaired. Current and former officials told the Moscow Times, but this is a step above and beyond that. They're getting ready for nuclear Armageddon. And you have every single country under the sun trying to get their hands on F-35s. You got Czech, Czech, former Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, buying 24 F-35 multi-role fighters because what else can you do? You know, if you got no money to spend, you might as well spend that no money on planes that apparently don't work that well. Romania buying 48 F-35s. We got U.S. deploying old crappy F-16s. Actually, the F-16s are probably better than the F-35s. I only say crappy compared to some of the other stuff that the Russians are using right now. But they're deploying them to Romania over uh, patrols in the Black Sea, and that is going to be used to not only enforce this grain corridor, but also to police the border there. So, you know, what could possibly go wrong? You got recon planes. You had a Russian recon plane, a Russian doomsday plane, in fact, fly in. I don't have the image on here, but the other day I showed you guys there was a U.S. Uh, reconnaissance drone, and that plane flew into it, so I presume that they were trying to jam its capabilities or something like that, but that's the stuff going on right now in the Black Sea, okay? We got Romania, Poland, all these countries buying nuclear weapons, you have uh, the nuclear weapons coming back to, what is it, uh, there's protests right now in England because they want to bring 50 F-35s armed with nuclear weapons back there. And they'll do it because that's the way things are going. And uh, it is what it is. So with respect to this whole Uzbekistan situation, I mean, they're saying... If you look at the fire and if you look at the videos that I don't want to show because anytime you show actual footage of explosions, YouTube doesn't like that. The algorithm doesn't like that, I should say. Now, if you look at numerous video footage, there definitely was a big bang. There was a big flash. So we can presume that th there had to be some explosive component to this. This wasn't just a big fire, obviously. There's a mushroom cloud, right? A non-nuclear one, thank God. But if you actually look at the base of the fire, it looks like a very hot chemical fire. It looks like they're saying that it was uh, lithium or something to that effect. Was it a combination of lightning, a gas pipeline, or some sort of gaseous agent and as well as uh, like a petrol fuel or possibly uh, EV lithium batteries? Because when lithium batteries, as far as I know, I don't know if they explode so much, but they start to emit... Uh, a lot of heat and they can flare up, but it's typically not a, a explosion, like not a, a big explosion that's gonna send out a shockwave. But again, I could be wrong, but it, when it's raining down in this incendiary debris, as it's showing in the video, it does indeed look like there's something going on here and it could have possibly been, some people are saying they manufacture various types of rounds. Um, somebody was saying tracer rounds, but I don't know why you would use tracer rounds. And do they use tracer rounds in war? Let me know, military guys. Uh, but anyways, Uzbekistan's primary trading partner are the following. Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Turkey, by a long shot. And you got South Korea and Germany down there. And the United States actually attempted to try to make some diplomatic headway just the other day. September 21st, 2023. Mr. CIA was there with the C5 plus one. I'm going to try to do this in one take. Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. I got it. 
Um, the C5 plus one presidential summit. So this is Washington trying to make inroads into this region. Did they fail is the question. You see, typically these major events and conflicts happen right after it appears as though nations are coming together and making diplomatic progress. Just like the Trudeau thing, you know, he goes to India for that trip, his plane doesn't work for some reason, then all of a sudden he's calling up these accusations against the Indian government that they assassinated somebody. But here's a classic example of this. 1933, UK, France, Italy, the Four Powers Pact. 1934, Poland and Hitler, the Pilsudski Pact. Uh, the UK, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. 1936 with Japan, uh, 1938, the UK German-British Non-Aggression Pact, 1938, France German Non-Aggression Pact, and it goes on and on and on, all the way up to 1939, Soviet Union Non-Aggression Pact with the Germans. And what happened in 1939 while well, World War II started? What happened in 1941? I think that's when the Russians started fighting uh, Operation Barbarossa with the uh, Germans invading. So you can't put a whole lot of stock in this stuff, really. And I think I've said this at, at one point before, it's, it's kind of like a last ditch Hail Mary diplomatic attempt when, you, when, it, when it just starts to look like, okay, we're making progress and uh, just out of nowhere, out of the blue, that's probably a sign that the shit's gonna hit the fan. That's why I'm very concerned if the U.S. comes to Iran, just, for, just as one example of this, and says, okay, we're ready to, we're ready to do a deal. We're ready to do, and, and maybe they get some sort of nuclear deal, right? And they get everybody to agree on it. You can almost bet that the shit's going to hit the fan. Okay, Minsk agreements, another classic example. All these things happen right before the shit hits the fan. So it's sad that we got to fear agreements because it's almost like, <laughs> you know, that's when it, you realize they get to that point and they realize, oh, okay, we have this agreement, but this shit is still bad blood between us, so it's untenable, so let's just go to war. Seems to be what happens anyways. Um, speaking of war, Korea insists that they're on the brink of nuclear war. Wow, great news. Great news. Don't worry, though. China's shipbuilding capacity is 200 times greater than the U.S., so for all you people who think, ah, China, they're still, they're still 50 years behind, one year goes by. Ah, China, they're still 25 years behind, another year goes by. Ah, China, they're still 10 years behind, another year goes by. Where's China? Oh, they're 20 years ahead of us. Chinese hackers, speaking of China, stole emails from U.S. State Department and Microsoft Breach. Who knows what the outcome of this one is going to be. Now, I don't think they're discussing a whole lot of classified information in these emails, but they'll no doubt get a, a sense of the attitudes and the sentiment from these emails because it's all from the State Department. So man, they're, they're going to get a lot of information. Let's just hope they have better translators than Amazon because uh, if it's Amazon, they're not going to know what the hell people are saying. My main man, Rafi Farber. This guy's on point, man. We got to get him back on the channel. He's agreed to come back. So if you guys have any financial questions, this is one of the best uh, guys to ask. Lynette Zhang again as well. Rafi Farber says, does anybody notice that oil is way up while the dollar index is rising? Means that the dollar strength is isolated to Forex markets. So a dollar is worth more compared to this other piece of shit over here, like a Canadian dollar. But is it really worth more? He says, not to actual goods and services. We are on the road to the end game. I had to retweet that one. That was, that was a very short and to the point. That's what tweets are supposed to be, short and to the point originally. Remember? SpaceX wins its first Pentagon tr contract for Starshield. Oh, what a surprise. Elon Musk is going to use all the technology originally promised for civilian use for military purposes. Could have seen that coming. Yellowknife awakens to the grossest morning in city history. The fires are still raging up here, guys. It's incredible. It is it's been the most apocalyptic fire season in Canada's history. Far and away. And this was the scene in Yellowknife the other morning. I don't know if it's still bad there now, but who knows. Anyways, my camera is overheating because it's freaking hot in here for some reason. We don't want to listen to what this clown has to say, do we? You, you guys all get the point. 
little Starlink animation there. I think that's all I got for you guys. Uh, Maria Zakharova basically said that the attack on Sevastopol was carried out by Ukraine in close coordination with American and British specialists. So what are you going to do about it, Medvedev and friends? Is just this another red line that you are going to allow the Americans across, or are you going to actually push back at some point? I guess time will tell. My friends, you take care. Have a good night. We will see you on the flip side. We got a lot of big projects that we have in the works, and that's what I've been doing. I've not been getting any sleep. And I want to thank you guys out there who've been saying, Nate, we notice you're packing on the pounds. That's what I need to hear. I'm not one of these bitches that gets all like, oh, uh, he said I'm fat. No, 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 no. And I don't mean bitches as in women. I just mean bitches in general, men or women. It doesn't matter. People who get offended because you talk about their weight. No, for me, that's motivation. That's what I want to hear. If I'm starting to let myself go, you guys need to tell me about it. All right? And uh, I appreciate that's motivation. Okay? And we're going we're gonna to bring it back. And I'm still, I'm still going to the gym on a regular basis. I'm still doing a lot of functional fitness, CrossFit style stuff, but I've just been eating too much, okay? I've just been uh, eating away my problems. Maybe this news is just getting the best of me, but it's not. I appreciate all that, you know, constructive trolling that makes me grind even harder. And boy, do we got some great videos coming up for you that I hope you will enjoy. Thanks for watching, my friends. Stay safe and let me know what your take on this whole Uzbekistan situation is if you happen to be an Uzbekistan expert. Thanks. Bye.